you turn your Bibles with me to the book of Mark as we continue our series through this book, we're going to be in verse 25 of Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 25. Hear the word of the Lord. Mark 1.25 reads, In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place, and was praying there. Let us pray that God's blessing would be upon His word. Father in heaven, I thank you for the great privilege it is to preach your word. I pray for unction. I pray for passion and zeal and for clarity. I pray that your people would be fed manna from heaven. That they would feed upon the truth of Scripture. That their souls would be nourished. And I pray if anyone who is anyone here who is lost, that they would find salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, that above all your name would be glorified. That Jesus Christ the man of perfect prayer would be glorified as everything he does is perfect. Everything he has done is perfect and he, receive, he deserves to receive glory for that. And so surely as I preach on his prayer life and how he is the perfect example for us in prayer, may he be glorified. And may he be glorified in each of us forever. Amen and amen. Amen. The title of this sermon is Prayer as Exemplified by Christ. Prayer as Exemplified by Christ. Prayer. What a precious grace it is. It is something that God has ordained that we enjoy ourselves in and that we commune with Him in. It is something that has, been, that has come down from heaven as a gift to the church. It is called a means of grace for a reason. Because it is a way in which we can receive the grace of God in our lives. It is a way in which we can call down blessings from heaven. It is a way in which we can approach the throne of grace and receive grace through the means of grace that prayer is. It is a joy. It is the joy of the child of God to pray. In fact, we are called to pray. To devote ourselves to prayer. To, to, to pray at all times in the Spirit. But how may we do it? How may we know how to do it? What time should we do it? Specifically, private prayer. Where do we do it? These and other questions are answered by looking to the life of our Lord. Looking to His prayer life. Looking to the Son of God. Christ is our perfect example in many things, and one of them being His prayer life. In fact, I submit to you this morning that there has been no other man who prayed like our Lord with quite the same fervor and passion and quite as pleasing to the Father. And it would do us well to consider how He prayed, the prayers He prayed, when He prayed, where He prayed, and even to consider the aspects of prayer itself. So, there are a few things this text will cause us to consider. Firstly, it is the time of prayer. Also, the place of prayer. Also, the essence of prayer itself, because it will make us ponder what is prayer, biblically. And lastly, we will find an answer to a question that is often raised when looking at a passage like this. Why did our Lord Jesus see it fit to pray? He being fully God, fully man, truly God, truly man, very God and very man, certainly had a powerful prayer life. None deny, no one denies that, but why? And that is what we will see answered also in this sermon. But before we go to the text itself, it is important that we remind ourselves of the context of what surrounds this passage, especially because it's been uh, we missed last week. So it's been a while since we've looked at this text. Specifically in verses 29 through 34 in this chapter, last time I preached, I preached on Christ's amazing healing ministry. 
further expounded there and displayed in chapter 1, where he healed Andrew's mother in law. He casted out many demons. He healed those who were afflicted. In fact, we read in verse 33 that the whole city had gathered at the door. He had a crowd. He had drawn a crowd because his preaching ministry, his ministry as a whole, who he was, was amazing. It had, it had garnered popularity. And rightly so. But we find our Lord, even though in the midst of great excitement amongst the people, even though there were many crowds and a crowd at the door there, many crowds making up a greater crowd, our Lord Jesus still saw it fit to rise early and to go off alone and to pray. And that is where we find ourselves in verse 35 concerning Christ's prayer life. So let us consider these realities that I just mentioned a moment ago as we look at this verse and other passages as well. For this text is simply a springboard to look at the greater, greater picture that is presented in Scripture concerning prayer. Our Lord is certainly the best example to look at, though. So let us first consider the time of prayer. The time of prayer. Beginning of verse 35 says, In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. This is important. Very important. About the time in which prayer ought to to come about, ought to take place. There is a biblical model that is put forth for us. There is a biblical example, even in the Old Testament, concerning prayer. And that is in the morning. A fitting time for the child of God to go before the Lord, to go into His private prayer closet, and to plead on behalf of others, to plead for His own soul, to plead for the souls of His children and His wife, is in the early morning. Perhaps even before any other in his house have awakened. Perhaps even before the sun has risen in the darkness of the morning. It is fitting for the child of God to go there and to win blessings. To call down prayer. To call down blessing from heaven upon himself and others. As mentioned, this is not only something that is put forward for us in the New Testament by the life of our Lord, but also in the Old Testament. Psalm 90, verse 14, and this is actually Moses's. <coughs> Moses speaking here, a psalm of Moses. He says, Oh, satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Psalm 5. It says, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Hear the sound of my cry for help, my King and my God. For to you I will pray. In the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. It is a decent thing for the child of God to perhaps retire early, to go to bed early that they themselves might rise early as our Lord Jesus did. This is not something that is a detail that ought to be overlooked. There is something very important about beginning our days with God. Beginning our days meditating upon the beauty, the power, and the glory of God. There is a wonderful aspect of starting one's day off by communing with the Most High. For as we go about our daily activities, we have, as it were, the glory of God resting upon us. As we go about the various activities of the day and busy ourselves with the things we ought to do, whether it be work or perhaps duties at home, cares for children, it will be as if there is glory radiating off of our faces, for we have gone into behind the veil, as it were, and beheld the glory of the Lord, as Moses himself did in the tabernacle, in the tent of meeting. There beholding the glory of God. And he came out and the Israelites saw the glory of the Lord upon his face. Because he had communed with God. Jesus our Lord saw it fit. Saw it fit. 
to deny himself and to go and pray early in the morning. Incredible. Incredible indeed. He delighted in his father. To please the father was his chief joy indeed. And so certainly to commune with him in prayer was delightful. Was delightful for the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only is prayer in the early morning an important practice, but also it is a practical practice. It is a practical practice. One, oftentimes we as Christians, if we say to ourselves, well, I will instead go to bed late and rise up late and commune with God in the evening, oftentimes the events of that day will stack upon one another. And by the time we have retired to our room for the evening, trying to set aside some time for prayer and the Word, we find ourselves beginning to drowse away. Falling asleep, as it were, during those precious spiritual exercises. Instead, it is practical that we go to bed early and that we rise early. For we are most fresh, we are most awake there in the early morning. Also, there is a sense in which God deals with the first fruits of things. We find in the Old Testament a pattern revealed to us that God asked and desired for the Israelites to dedicate the firstborn of, the, of their families, the firstborn sons, unto the Lord. God desires the first and best of all that we have. In fact, it is not something that is expressly commanded, although it is a great, it is a good idea for you to give offerings unto the Lord out of your first fruits, out of what you've received for the month. It's certainly a good idea to do so. And how much more with our day, brethren? How much more with our day once we have gotten a good night's rest? To wake up, and before we have even looked upon our spouse's face, <coughs> to go into the private place and to commune with the Most High and to dedicate unto Him the first fruits of our day. To dedicate unto Him those first precious moments. And therefore also we will not find ourselves at the end of the day trying to cram in disciplines of grace. Instead, by the time the sun has risen for most of us, we will have already communed with God. We will have already heard His voice in the Scriptures. We will have already beheld the beauty of Christ. And we will be ready to take on whatever we so encounter that day. It is a practical thing, brethren. Not only is it an important thing, but a practical thing. Let it be said of us that in the early morning, while it was still dark, Lucas got up to pray. Let it be said of us, in the early morning, while it was still dark, Joe got up and prayed. Let it be said of us, that in the early morning, while it was still dark, Sidney got up and prayed. For we must commune with God. We must, indeed. And it is certainly fitting, important, practical, for us to do it in the early morning. To follow in the footsteps of our Lord. When a young child admires his father and thinks very much of him, which even I myself experienced in my younger years, what is often the natural inclination? It is to walk in his father's footsteps, quite literally. If a father is perhaps living, lives somewhere up north and it, snow has freshly fallen upon the ground and he walks outside to do some work in the morning, left footsteps in the snow, if his son thinks greatly of him, perhaps in his innocency and in some of his ignorance, he wants to literally follow in the footsteps of his father. So he tries to imitate even the way his father steps and to literally place his feet in his footsteps. Spiritually, we ought to do the same with our Lord. We ought to follow in His footsteps. And therefore, let us be wise and discerning and see that Christ is our model in prayer. Concerning the time of prayer. Secondly, consider with me the, the place of prayer as we continue through verse 35. It says, In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. And then it says, that he left the house and went away to a secluded place. 
Not only is it necessary, practical, important, that we get up in the mornings to pray, before the day has begun, but it is also necessary that it be done in private, that it be done in a secluded place, a place where we ourselves are alone with God. For God desires that we ourselves be alone with Him in prayer. This is something that is put forth in Scripture as not merely an option or not merely a good model to follow, but absolutely necessary to prayer. To an effective prayer life, one must have privacy. One must have seclusion. To give an example from my own life, I remember that when I lived my, with my parents in the RV, uh, in the back there in the bunk room, my father built uh, eight bunks, six of which were very large for the, lar for the taller children. And uh, we each had our own personal space. However, there was not a great level of privacy in terms of if you were on your own bed. And of course, after the Lord saved me, I had a great desire to be alone with God in prayer. And so, what I constructed was a curtain that I pulled along my bed. And I would actually tuck it under my mattress and try and cover up every little crack that I could and seclude myself, cocoon myself back there in that RV. And some of the most precious moments in communion with God have I had on that bunk bed, on that top bunk in the back of that RV. What a joy it has been to commune with God in prayer where no man's eyes saw me. And many times no one knew that I was there. In the wee hours of the morning, before the sun had risen many times, there I was, praying, petitioning, pleading, thanking, praising the Most High. It was certainly a place of much joy. Scripture presses this, in, this necessity It is said of the Lord Jesus in the book of Matthew, Matthew 14, 23. It said after he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. Mark 6, 46. After Jesus fed the 5,000, after bidding them farewell, he left to the mountain, or left for the mountain to pray. Our Lord saw it fit. Not fit only, but necessary that he be alone in prayer. even to the neglect of his very close associates, his disciples. We even find here in Mark 1, it says in uh, verse 37, speaking of the disciples, they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. But our Lord knew that he must be alone. He must be in seclusion. There are multiple reasons why we ought to pray in private. One is to prevent pride. What did our Lord Jesus say in His Sermon on the Mount? His most famous exposition of truth. He said in Matthew 6, 5, that when we pray, we are not to be like the hypocrites who stand in public places and offer up petitions to God. Such people are not heard. They are not heard because they want to be seen by men rather than recognized by the Most High. See, God is imminent. He is near. He is everywhere. He is omnipresent, and therefore He can see all things. And in the most private places, he sees. He sees us, brethren. And that is what matters in prayer. Not what man thinks of us. Let us not be so proud as to go out into the public places and offer up petitions in public just so that way we might be manifested, that we might be holy. We're trying to produce some sort of righteousness. Trying to show off how better we are than others. It is to prevent pride. We are to be in prayer, privately, alone with God, to prevent pride. Secondly, it is to be focused. It is to be focused. What happens, especially in our day and age, brethren, with the media sensation that is going on around us? Television sets everywhere, computer monitors all over the place, cell phones in our pockets, now called smartphones, all their features. We have media always being pushed toward us, always being pushed in our face. We can hardly go on Facebook without being distracted by something that is presented before our eyes. It is fitting that we turn off such things 
set aside such things and go alone in private that we might not be distracted. Distracted prayer is not effectual prayer. Prayer in which we are only halfway engaged and we are simply giving lip service unto God is not prayer at all. It is a prayer that's not heard by God. Prayer comes forth from the heart and it comes to be <laughs> focused upon the Most High God. That is the essence of true prayer. So let us guard ourselves. Let us be vigilant, circumspect. Let us guard our prayer lives from distraction. And let us follow in the footsteps of our Lord who left the house and went away to a secluded place. He went away to a secluded place. It, it was not a place which was halfway secluded and had halfway distraction. It was a place that was secluded. It was private. It was alone. There was not a soul in sight. Let us do that whatever the cost. He left the house. For a time and for a moment, he disassociated himself. He pulled himself away, even from his close companions. You who are married, it is great. Marriage is a great gift from God indeed. And husbands and wives ought to pray together, for they are one flesh. However, we find in 1 Corinthians, it is said that it is good for a husband and wife to agree to separate for some time. To go off alone in prayer. And to seek the face of God. Certainly it is. It is quite fitting to do so. I remember being told by my mother one time that her herself and my father had uh, separate quiet times in the mornings where they would commune with God. And then before my father would leave for work in the mornings, he would sit down at the dining room table with my mom and he would share with her what jewels he has brought forth the scriptures. And there was a conjugal unity there. There was a conjugal communion there. For some spouses it may look different. But we ought to, yes, spouses ought to commune together as they commune with God. We ought to be praying together with our spouses. But also, it is fitting that we pray alone. Thirdly, a reason why we ought to pray in private is that we want to receive heavenly rewards. A fitting reason to pray to God in private is to receive heavenly rewards. Think about the Pharisee who stands on the public corner and prays aloud that he may be noticed by men. Will such a man be rewarded? Will such a woman be rewarded who parades her private prayer life before men in order to receive praise from them? Certainly not. We must keep our prayer lives secluded that we would receive heavenly rewards. Jesus told us in Matthew 6, 6, to go back to that text I referenced earlier. He told us to go alone, go off alone, that our Father who sees what is done in secret would reward us. Brethren, think about that. There are heavenly blessings awaiting. God is willing. God is ready to dispense blessing upon His people. Only what did our Lord Jesus say? You do not have because you do not ask. Let that not be said of us. Let that not be said of this church. Let that not be said of this preacher that I had not because I did not ask. Oh, brethren, think about all that Christ has laid hold for us. Laid hold of for us. Think about all the blessings of holiness Christ has purchased for us by His blood. Let us go alone. Let us rise early in the morning and grab hold of those things which have been bought by Christ. They are free. We simply must grab them. And let us do so in private prayer. Also, it is important that we note this. Not all prayer ought to be private, though. There is only a certain aspect, a certain type of prayer that is private prayer. There are other types. Public prayer. 
which is something which we engage in here. Myself and Job, as we stand before the people and lift up petition unto God and praise and thanksgiving, that is public prayer, and that is fitting and well-pleasing to God. It is certainly okay for the child of God to lead others in a word of prayer. Not all prayer is to be private. Not all of it. Certainly the grand bulk of our prayer lives ought to be private. Ought to take place in that private place. But we think about if we ourselves have encountered perhaps a co-worker who is experiencing trouble. A fellow saint who works with us experiencing trial. Perhaps at that moment we would like to bow our heads with him in a word of prayer. Right there on the spot at work. It is fitting for us to do so. It pleases God. I think about when I'm on the streets right before I open your preach. If there is a fellow citizen with me, a fellow soldier of the cross, I will certainly pray with them. We will pray together that God's blessing would be upon the preaching of His Word. That is not wrong. That's not wrong in the sight of God. It pleases God. So though we ought to give ourselves to private prayer, that is not all we ought to give ourselves to. And what does Scripture also advocate for? Praying in the family. As I mentioned, husbands and wives ought to pray together. That's not fully private. They each see which it, what the other is praying for. But all, even beyond that, mothers and fathers ought to pray with their children. Families that pray together are holy families indeed. Prayers that lift up petition, thanksgiving, and praise unto God are holy families indeed. Fathers ought to lead their families in family worship. They ought to. And so it is fitting for them to pray publicly in that manner. But let us not, in any public prayer, do it that we might be noticed by men. But may we pray as if there is no man standing around, as if it is just us standing before the Most High, and we are in His presence. Thirdly, I want us to consider the essence of prayer. The essence of prayer. Look with me at the end of verse 35 of Mark 1. It simply says, And was praying there. And he was praying there. Now that we have thoroughly covered the time in which prayer ought to be had, also the place in which prayers ought to be offered up, we ask ourselves, what are some aspects of prayer? What is prayer itself? I want us to consider some of the aspects of prayer. Some of the elements of what, what comprises biblical prayer. And I want to confine our search, our query in the scriptures to the book of Psalms. So we will look at a few different passages out of the Psalms to exemplify for us, to show us various aspects of prayer. And there are four areas, four aspects of prayer that I'd like to cover. One is repentance. Two is thanksgiving. Three is praise. And four is petitions or supplication. Let us consider the first one, repentance which really ought to be upon our minds and hearts at the beginning of our prayers. A place that we can turn to for this is found in Psalm 51, where we find the sinner's prayer. The sinner's prayer. This was David writing after he had committed his grievous sin with Bathsheba, and he, of course, had been broken. God had disciplined him. He had used Nathan the prophet to bring him to repentance. And so now he writes this glorious song that reveals a broken heart. He says in verse 9, Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Herein do we find that the psalmist is praying for forgiveness. He says in verse 10, Create in me a clean, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. These are things, of course, the Lord Jesus would not have prayed for in His perfect life because He was perfect. One aspect that the Lord Jesus certainly did not engage in was repentance, for He had nothing to repent of. So it would do us no good to try and search in the Scriptures for a place in which we find the Lord Jesus repenting, for He had no need. The only place we have Christ associated with repentance is in Matthew chapter 3 where He is baptized 
in John's baptism, which was a baptism of repentance. And why did he do that for us, on our behalf? And also, as I mentioned before, that was also a, a mark of the beginning of his ministry, where he was anointed by the Spirit of the Most High to, to be sent out to do what he came to do to accomplish redemption. But other, but other than that, Christ certainly did not pray, Oh God, forgive me, for there was nothing to be forgiven concerning him. Verse 11 of Psalm 51 says, Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Brethren, we hear find, we hear, see a couple of things concerning repentance. And that is one, it has a net negative aspect to it, in which we are to confess our sins before God. 1 John 1 9 says that we are to confess our sins, and God will forgive us. Confess. Name them, my brethren, before God. Name them, one by one. That is, the, that is the negative aspect of repentance. And then the positive aspect is that we say, Oh God, we cry out to the Most High, Oh God, cause me to walk in Your way. Cause me to walk in Your truth. Cause me to be conformed to the image of Christ. Do not take Your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of salvation. So let us therefore employ both the negative and positive aspects of repentance in our own lives, in our own prayer lives. Also, thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, which is also exemplified in the Psalms for us, in Psalm 118. Psalm 118, beginning in verse 1, it simply reads, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His loving kindness is everlasting. Down to verse 28. You are my God and I give thanks to you. You are my God, I extol you. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. For His loving kindness is everlasting. Brethren, we ought to be led to be thankful in prayer. As we come upon this season in which everyone around us in the pagan world even. Is becoming thankful are making mention of things that they are grateful for. Even the wicked can experience a measure of thankfulness. <coughs> Not for God, truly. But a measure of gratitude for the things they do have. However, brethren, only the true child of God can express true gratitude unto God. For God only hears the prayers of the righteous. God does not hear the prayers of the wicked. And so therefore, let us, especially during this season in which we are to Recall the many blessings God has bestowed upon us. The many graces God has shed upon our lives. Let us be thankful. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercies are everlasting. Let us give thanks not only for the good things that we experience, not only the pleasures that we have in this life, but also for the trials and the heartache and the pain. For in such things do, does God use... Such things does God use to draw us near to Himself and to conform us to the image of His Son. As Brother Job prayed earlier, that God works all things for our good. For our good. Not our comfort, but our good character. So therefore, let us be thankful. Let us be thankful not only for those things, but chiefly for the Gospel itself. For the work of our Redeemer, that Christ Jesus has accomplished redemption for His people, that He died for His bride. Let us be thankful to Him for that. Thirdly, a third aspect of prayer is praise. It is lifting up exaltation, worship to God. Sometimes when we talk about prayer, we simply mean petitions or supplication. However, the, the more broad term that's used in Scripture, and oftentimes even when we talk theology, when we discuss the things of God, Prayer can mean all four of these things. They fit under that same category. Toward the end of the book of Psalms, do we find some Psalms of praise? <coughs> Psalm 143. Oh, I'm sorry, 145, excuse me. Psalm 145, beginning in verse 1. David writes, I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. 
Great is the Lord and highly to be praised, and His greatness is unsearchable. Here David lifts up praise to God. Also the last psalm of the book of Psalms, Psalm 150, which is clearly speaking on praise to God. Listen to what it says. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty expanse. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with harp and lyre. Praise Him with trumpet, with tremble. And dancing. Praise Him with stringed instruments and pipe. Praise Him with loud cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise <coughs> Yahweh. Praise the Lord. I think that psalm is speaking of praise. Brethren, let us in prayer praise God. Let us worship God. In fact, when we speak of our own private times with God, Oftentimes the phrase is used, my quiet time, or my personal devotions. Let us use a more biblical term, my private worship. For that is what it is, primarily. It is worship to God. And when we speak of our, our devotions between husbands and wives, where they both study the scriptures together and pray, let us say it is conjugal worship. And then when we speak of families meeting together, the father, the mother, the children praying together, let us not say family devotion, family Bible time. Let us use the phrase family worship. For it is worship. It is worship unto God. Praise ought to be intertwined throughout our prayers. There ought to be an explosion of exuberant exaltation toward God. For all of who He is and for all of what He has done for us in Christ. And all of what He continues to do by His providence in our very lives. Fourthly, we find petitions. In Psalm 143, we find petitions. And this is, of course, what takes up the vast majority of our time in prayer. Psalm 143, verse 1 says, this is David writing. He says, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. Answer me in your faithfulness, in your righteousness. And do not enter into judgment with your servant. For in your sight no man living is righteous. For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me dwell in dark places like those who have long been dead. Therefore my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart is appalled within me. Let's get down to verse 10. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. For the sake of your name, O Lord, revive me. In your righteousness bring my soul out of trouble. And in your loving kindness cut off my enemies and destroy all those who afflict my soul. For I am your servant. Hear the, hear the desperation, brethren. When we, go to the, when we go to the Lord in prayer, and we cry out that God would save our unconverted family members, that God would make us holy, that God would, would bless our ministry, that God would bless our work, even our, our, our secular work that we engage in, which itself is a ministry. May we do it not with, with the coldness of heart. May we not pray to God as, Oh God, Bless me for your name's sake. Brethren, let us give our hearts to it. Let us say, oh God, bless me for your name's sake. Let us cry out with vigor and passion. How many times have we watched a sports game and reacted with more emotion than we give to prayer? Let us pour out our hearts in prayer. Do not be fearful of being emotive in prayer. Do not be fearful of pouring out your heart to God. For a broken and contrite heart God does not despise. Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. What is the heart of petition? What is the heart of pleading to God for things? Desperation. Desperation. Brethren, we must be desperate. We must be desperate in prayer. 
There is desperation when we cry out to God. There is a desperation because we ourselves cannot bring about what we're pleading for. We cannot save a soul. We cannot move someone's heart to do something. We cannot change a financial situation. We cannot cause someone's health to go from bad to good. We cannot cause our marriages to be holy. Therefore, we cry out in desperation, saying, Oh God, if you do not act, if you do not act, I will fail, I will fall, and I will be ruined. Do you not hear that in the psalm, brethren? Do you not hear that pouring forth from David's heart? In fact, from the first line there, my translation puts an exclamation point after the phrase, Give ear to my supplications. And even it puts another exclamation point after, answer me in your faithfulness, in your righteousness. And I think it is fitting that it did so. So let us therefore offer up repentance, thanksgiving, praise, and petitions to God. Fourthly, I would like us to consider, why did our Lord Jesus... See it fit to pray. Why did the Lord Christ see it fit to pray? One answer is because of his humility and his humanity. John Gill, the famed Bible commentator, said this on this verse. He said, as man, to his God and Father, it may be for his disciples he had lately chosen, for himself as a man, that he might be strengthened as such for service and for its success in His ministry, and that His gospel might run and be glorified. John Gill offers up some possible answers as to why Jesus prayed. I think those are very valid answers. Pray for strength, because He was what? We just studied this morning. He had human nature. He was a man. He, had, he experienced physical limitations in His humility. And so He prayed for strength. We also can speculate He prayed for His disciples. Think about this. We find in John 17, who did he pray for? <coughs> you and me. He prayed for us, brethren. And what is called the high priestly prayer there in the garden before his crucifixion, he prayed for his church, for his people, and for his gospel, that it might run and be glorified. Another reason Christ prayed was because he is our example. Think about that, brethren. This was done as an example to us. One of the reasons Christ did this very thing was to bring about His being our perfect example so that we could read this scripture some 2,000 years later and see how we ourselves can give us, give ourselves to prayer just as our Lord Jesus did. Also, He did it because of His love towards and His delight in the Father. He loved His Father. Loved, he delighted in the Father. As I mentioned before, there is a great love between the members of the Trinity for one another. And so therefore, he thoroughly enjoyed and delighted in the discipline of prayer. How often do we look at prayer as, a, as this, this big burden? How often do we look at prayer as something that is, that is wearisome? When our Lord saw it as a pleasure and as a delight. Let us steer clear of such foolishness. And because he had to fulfill all righteousness. That's another reason. Our prayers are imperfect, brethren. How often do we experience in prayer that we feel we have not prayed effectually? We have not prayed. We didn't say the things correctly. We weren't reverential enough. We weren't paying enough attention. We weren't repentant enough. We weren't thankful enough. We weren't, we weren't filled with enough worship and praise toward God. And our petitions were faulty. We asked for things we ought not ask for. Or we did not ask for things we should have asked for. Take heart, brethren. Because Jesus Christ prayed perfectly for us. Hallelujah. He prayed perfectly for us on our behalf. So that when his righteousness is given to us in salvation. When it is imputed to us. The father looks at us. As if we had a perfect prayer life. Because Jesus had a perfect prayer life. My brethren I exhort you to pray in the morning. If possible. It is not a hard and fast rule. But it is a good idea. Certainly a good idea because it was exemplified by our Lord. 
And I exhort you to pray privately, and that is a command. That's a command out of Scripture. You must give yourself to private communion with God. I exhort you to offer up thanksgiving, praise, repentance, petitions, all unto the one true God through Christ and the power of the Spirit. And ultimately to rest in Christ's perfect <coughs> In those moments of weakness, rest knowing that Jesus' righteousness has been given to you if you are abused. Rest knowing that the Father looks at you as having had a perfect prayer life. And you religious hypocrites, your lack of prayer reveals your lack of conversion. If you do not pray, you're not converted. You, if you don't pray, you're not a Christian. Point blank, because if you were spiritually alive, guess what you would do? You would talk. When a baby is born, it is inevitable that that baby will start to speak. Even though oftentimes the beginning words are very mumbled, they will begin to develop speech. They will know how to talk. So it is with the one who is born again. They will develop the ability to pray unto God, to utter prayers up to the Most High. Therefore, if you do not pray, you know not Christ. And the only prayer that you ought to be offering up to God is a prayer that God would have mercy upon your soul and save you for Jesus' sake. And it is the same for you who are irreligious at all, who don't even claim to know Christ. The call is still the same, to cry out to God for mercy, that you might be saved by His grace and for His glory. So in conclusion, we have seen the time of prayer. We have seen the place of prayer. We have seen the essence of prayer. That being repentance, thanksgiving, praise, and petitions. And then lastly, we saw why did our Lord Jesus see it fit to pray? Brethren, the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the God who the Lord Jesus Christ prays to, is holy, perfect, righteous. Righteous is He. We find in the Psalms, that, uh, we just read sections of the Psalms, we find in Psalm 119, 137, it says, Righteous are you, O Lord, and I'm right are your judgments. And we find that we ourselves are unrighteous in light of God's righteousness. Because God has given His law, and we cannot keep it. We have broken it. God says you shall not lie, we've lied. God says you shall not steal, we've stolen. And our law breaking earns us hell. Hell. The place of torment is where we are headed outside of Christ. However, God in His great love for His people, while still upholding His holiness and His justice, chose the people unto Himself before the worlds were made and sent Christ into the world to save that people. And Jesus came and fulfilled the law for that people, prayed on behalf of that people, died upon the cross for that people, bore the wrath of God for that people, was raised on the third day for that people. And 40 days later was exalted in glory for that people. And the call of the gospel is that one must repent and believe that there would be numbered amongst those people. If they are to be in that great group of people who are saved by Christ, they must repent and believe, and God will forgive them and give them the righteousness of Christ, all by His grace. And they themselves will not continue on in their life of sin. They will walk in holiness. They will walk in purity. They will delight in the truth of God because God has done a work in them. Because God has raised them up to spiritual life. They will not be men and women of prayer. Things which they want, once were not, they will not be. Because God has changed them. It is all by God's grace. Ultimately, all that God is all that so that God might receive the glory. And all things ultimately are to the glory of God. And may our chiefest prayer. The prayer that towers above every other prayer that we offer up to God ought to be this. O oh Lord, may you be glorified in me and in all things as they forever redound to your glory. Indeed. Christ be all the glory forever. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, I praise you for your power and your wisdom. 
and for the fact that Christ Jesus in his perfect life perfectly exemplified for us prayer, how we ought to pray. So may we be like him. May we all be found on the last day to be in him by his grace and for his glory. May he be glorified truly in all things forever. Amen.